Well, good morning. morning. How you guys doing? Woo! Hey, well, I want to welcome you here this morning. My name is Brett, and I am the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and uh, wooing is my thing. (laughs) Grant said it's not his, it is mine, and uh, we had some family in town this past week for a while. It's actually past weekend. And after my brother Curtis left, you know how, you know, brothers make fun of each other because they love each other, right? That's what you do. He sent me a really cool picture. Just recently, ESPN did a 30 for 30 on Ric Flair. Anybody know Ric Flair, Nature Boy? Woo! And so he sent this picture of Ric Flair, eyes big, going, woo! And he said, Brett on a Sunday. And I'm like, you know what? It's coming back. It's coming back. You know, ESPN's going to do a 30 on 30. We're going to, or 30 for 30. We're going we're gonna to bring it to life here at New Life. So yes, woo is my thing. I do that because we should be excited to be here on Sunday, especially with this gorgeous weather, huh? How about this? You guys, Minnesota is awesome. I love it. You get like 10 inches of snow on one day and then 46 degrees a couple days later. This is beautiful. Absolutely incredible. Now they're calling for freezing temperatures. It's amazing. <laughs> Sub-zero. It's going to be so good. Living in Minnesota is exciting. Being at church on Sunday is exciting. And so we should woo. You know, as we think about exciting things in our life, hopefully you guys have exciting things in your lives. How many people here are dreamers of even more exciting things? Anybody? Wow, a lot of dreamers in the room. I am a dreamer. I love what's going on now, but self-admitted, I have a hard time at times getting excited and being in the moment of what's happening here because I love dreaming about what's coming next. I love looking to the future, thinking about what is and what it could be and where we could go. And I recently saw a movie that totally played into this, which is probably now my favorite movie or at least one of my top five. It was the movie The Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman. Anybody seen this movie? If you have, you're probably singing the songs right now. It is a musical. It is very catchy. And it is a fictional account of P.T. Barnum, the individual who founded the circus. And P.T. Barnum was a dreamer. He saw the way things were, and he saw what they could be, and he had a passion for making them what it was that they could be. And I walked out of this movie going, yes, just think of the things the way that they could be. I believe that we live in a world that dreams. That we are individuals that naturally think about what can be, and we long for what it could be. As I look over history, we see dreamers all over the place that have reinvented the world from what it was to what it is today. And we see that in history. We see that in our modern world today. In fact, one of the greatest speeches of all time started with an excerpt that said, I have a dream. I have a dream. A dream of what could be. And you hear people today, I was just watching the news a couple weeks ago, and there was a group of individuals on CNN talking about what the future will look like. And they were dreaming about what it could be. And they had all these hypotheses and all these things that it could look like. And yet they were off by just a little bit because they put the responsibility of that dream on us as human beings, and that's not where it lies. The Greatest Showman was exciting because it was an individual who was dreaming about what he wanted to see. And in many ways, there were a lot of similarities between what I think you and I want to see because what P.T. Barnum did was he took a world that was in chaos and gave it pleasure. He took a world that was struggling to smile and gave it something worth smiling about. He took a world that was separated, that had the haves and the have-nots, and he took the have-nots and he made them the haves. And he put them on stage and said, the things that you are making fun of, the things that you are laughing about, the people that you have thrown out, I will make them the reason you come and watch. The way that the movie turned out is P.T. Barnum took those that nobody loved, that nobody cared about, that didn't have a place, and he gave them a place. And he created the greatest show on earth. And I walked out of that excited because in many ways there's similarities to what Jesus does in our lives. Because I think all of us here, we're, we're willing to admit, we're dreaming of something better. Of something that could be. Not necessarily what it is, but where we're going to. And that's what this group on CNN was talking about. What could it be? And you know what they were talking about? A world where we all lived in harmony. 
a world that we created where we lived in harmony. You know what that dream speech was about? A world where we would live in harmony, where we would all be equal, where we would all be on the same page. You know what I dream about? A world where we would all just get along. And yet I know that I could never create that. And so I get excited because as I dream, I dream of the day that someday will be a reality. The day when Jesus returns because of what he has done through his blood, through his love, that dream, that longing that we have within us is something that was at the beginning and someday will be again. And we get to look at that and dream of that day when it will arrive because it's not just a dream, it's a reality. It's something that someday will be where all rights will be made wrong. No, that's not it. All wrongs will be made right. All tears will disappear. All people will get along. In the meantime, what I get excited about, what I dream about, is that we can give the world the ability to see that in a small glimpse right here, right now. You know how we do that? Through the church. P.T. Barnum took the craziest the oddest, the strangest, the outcasts, and he put them together and he said, this is what the world's going to want to come and see. And Jesus has done the same thing. He's taken the craziest, the oddest, the strangest people, and he's put us all together in one room. (laughs) And he has said, this is what the world will want to come and see. And we get to play a role in that. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we say, yes, I am in, and we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, he has very clearly told us then that we have the opportunity, we have a role, we have a part in showing the world what they are dreaming about. And I am so excited to be able to do that. And so a couple weeks ago, we rolled out a new mission statement as a church to help people find new life in Christ, to help people find what it is that they're looking for. And that begins right here. We have to be individuals that have found that. We have to be ones that live that out. And the way that we have said we're going to do that is through four things. Pursue, connect, serve, reach. And we're going to be a people that pursues God every day because he pursued us. He sent Jesus, his son, himself, in person, on the cross to die for us so that we can have a way to be in relationship with him once again. That relationship then is lived out. Our relationship with God is lived out within the context of community with each other. And so as we know him, as we have been saved by Christ, as we have followed him, then relationship with uh, with each other, we must connect with each other. We must love each other. We must care for each other. We must be in the highs with each other and the lows with each other. Strengthen each other. Push each other. Challenge each other. Hold each other accountable. And then we must serve each other. And that's what we're going to be studying today. What would it look like if we served each other? And as I say serve each other, some of you are sitting there going, I do that really, really well. Awesome. That's fantastic. We want to continue to emphasize that. Some are sitting there going, I don't do that really, really well. That's great because we want to help every single person in here figure that out, all of us, over and over and over again, wherever you've been, wherever you've gone, whatever you've done, that we continue to ask that question again and again and again. God, how have you wired me so that I can serve this body? So when we do that well, when we are that glimpse of what the future will look like through Jesus, then we can take that with us and show the rest of the world, and they're going to look at us going, I want to be a part of that. And in the middle of that, every single one of us has a role. So you open with me this morning to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at a passage. Paul, who is one of the founders of the church as we know it today, was traveling through the Middle East, through the modern world at the time, and he was writing letters to individuals, to churches, to different people that he had helped establish. And one of them is to the Corinthians. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he's writing to them about the role that they're playing within this glimpse that God is giving the world of what his hope is for everybody. And we're going to take a look at that. So if you have a Bible, open with me. If you don't have one, I'd love to give you one. There's going to be a number of them on the back table back there. If you don't have one, grab one. If you don't want to use a hard copy, you can download it on any app. As Grant mentioned, we have an app that we're using that also has all the slides on there, the scripture passages. It has a link to the giving app. It has a number of different things. Uh, One of our hopes as we move forward is that we minimize our communication, simplify it, and really make this thing right here, the bulletin when you come in, the app that you can download, and then the website, the primary forms of communication. 
And so that we can take on Sundays, as you heard Grant today sharing a bunch of information, we can take some of those moments and we can continue to worship and not have to maybe step into some of the information stuff. So if you take one of these, download that app, and uh, updating, refreshing our website as we speak, hopefully we can get the information out as simple as we possibly can so we all can be on the same page. So open with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret that which is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. We're going to pause there as we go through these verses this morning. There's a number of things that I want to point out. The first one I want to point out this morning is this. We each have a unique gift to use that the Spirit has given to us. We each have a unique gift to use that the Spirit has given to us. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior and you have stepped in and said that I want to follow him, the Bible tells us here that the Spirit then empowers us and gives us a gift. And each one of us has been given a unique gift, which I think is incredible. In fact, you, as you sit here today, should be very fortunate or feel very fortunate and very special that you have something unique to offer. I have conversations many times over and over and over again with individuals that say, you know what, I don't know what I could do. I don't really have anything to offer. I don't have anything to give to people. Well, this verse right here says you're wrong. Each one of us has been given a unique gift and that we have the ability to use that within this context, within the church. Yet, at times, that uniqueness can get in our way. How many people here like individuals that are totally different than you are? Right? Probably not. In fact, when you study the people group that you are surrounded by, more than likely, you have people that are around you that are a lot like you. It's our natural tendency. We do that. We bring people around us that are a lot like us. In fact, when I worked with Target for a number of years, they taught us to do two things. They taught us, to, when we were interviewing, to interview past the halos and the horns. The halos were those things that when somebody said it, you immediately went, oh, that's so awesome. Oh, I really, really like you. And if you learn how to interview, you can study the person that you're interviewing with and you can figure those things out pretty quick. In fact, in the middle of a conversation, I can learn real fast what somebody really, really enjoys and what somebody doesn't, right? If you got talking about sports, you get talking about outdoors, some of this stuff, you can real quick tap into a commonality with somebody where you can connect with that person whether or not you actually even like what it is that you're talking about. How many women here when they dated said they liked football? Maybe like one of you actually like it. But many of you probably said you did because you wanted to connect with that person that you were in love with and they were the best individual ever. And so then that guy who's dating you saw that halo around your head and went, I'm marrying an angel. <laughs> oh, she's everything I've ever wanted. She loves football. Well, did you ask the tougher questions to get around that halo? Probably not because we stayed there. We loved it. We really liked it. And then there's the horns, the things that somebody says that immediately you go, mmm, I don't really like that. I'm probably not going to hang out with you later. We have that in our lives, and we put people around us that have similarities. And yet, within that uniqueness, each one, have, each one of us has something different to offer. That difference shouldn't separate us. That difference shouldn't push us away from each other. That difference should bring us together. As it goes on, it says that we are unique, and yet our unique gifts reflect the Trinity. In our differences, our unique gifts reflect the Trinity. Verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. But back to verse 4, it says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. 
There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. Our uniqueness, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. In that uniqueness, we reflect the Trinity. In fact, it says it right there in verse 4, 5, and 6. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who works in all of us. So when you think about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit that gives the gifts as we serve the Lord, as we serve Jesus, while God works in different ways through all of us. Three in one. Uniqueness brought together within a whole. So instead of looking at each other as weird because we're different, we should be looking at each other going, oh, that's fantastic. I don't have what you have, and I don't have what you have, and I don't have what you have, but together, we have something that's very, very, very unique in and of itself. We reflect the Trinity. As Paul continues, we're one but many, as he explains next in verse 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. Or in our day today, we could rewrite this verse to say some are Vikings fans, some are Bears fans, some are forced to be Packers fans, and some don't care about football at all. We're different, but we're unified. Continue on, but we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. So the same spirit that's given each one of us unique gifts is the one behind all of it bringing us together. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Point number three, each part has a very specific role. How many people here have ever broken their pinky toe? Anybody? A couple of you. How many people have never really paid attention to their pinky toe until they broke it? What does your pinky toe do? It's just weird. It's got a really small nail that many of us, is kind of disgusting. I'm not a foot guy. I don't like feet. But that pinky toe, what does it do? Well, you don't really know what it does until you break it, and then you realize that it makes the rest of your body hurt. And that's what this passage is saying. We can't all be one thing. We all have uniquenesses. We can't look at each other and go, strange, you're strange because you don't have what I have because you play a role that's very specific to what it is that you do. It's interesting, as I'm studying this, I'm thinking about the pinky toe, and I happen to be skiing with a guy who skis with these telemark skis. They're not the alpine skis where you go like this. They're the ones where you like almost cross-country ski down the hill. And I was asking about the technique because it's very strange, and it looks like you're doing lunges the whole time. And I'm like, why would you do that? This looks like a lot of work. He's talking about the balance. When you ski with alpine skis, you're putting the balance on the inside of your foot on your big toe. That's really where you're putting all of your weight. He goes, when you're using telemark skis, it's the opposite. It's the outside foot on your pinky toe. And all of a sudden I went, there is a purpose for pinky toes. It's to ski with these weird skis that I don't know why people use them. So at least there's one purpose out there for the pinky toe. But this passage is telling us there's a purpose for every single one of us, and that purpose is very specific, and it was given for a reason. Read this verse right here with us. Uh, Go back up to... uh, Eighteen. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Every single part of our body was made specifically for a purpose and put right where it was supposed to be. What if our eyes were down by our feet? What would that look like? That'd be strange. That'd be kind of hard. Like, I know a lot of people that are short and your eyes are about my chest. And so I don't know what that's like. I think that would be weird. I've tried to get down like in a crowd and you can't see over people's heads. Like, I'm not used to that. (laughs) 
Like when I'm in a crowd, I can see for miles and I've met people that can't do that. That's weird. But what if your feet is where your eyes were? Or what if your hands were on your back? What if it just happened to be that way? And yet this passage says that every single body part was given a specific reason and put right where it was supposed to be, right where God wants it. And the same thing holds true with us. But the Spirit very intentionally gave us a purpose, gave us a reason, every single one of us, and he's put you right where you're supposed to be. There is no accident. There is no mistake in that. Grant mentioned stories. I love hearing stories. Grant loves hearing stories. We really do want to hear your story. I had an opportunity this week to hear a couple incredible stories of individuals that God had moved and put in different places and planted right where they were supposed to be. And many of them sitting there going, why am I here? What is the reason? Why am I in this place at this time? And yet it was very clear that God had brought them to New Life Church. And as they sat in front of me, as they shared their story, it was like, Boom, that's what it is. There is no mistake that you are here right now for this purpose at this time. What is that purpose? Well, each one of us has a purpose. Let's go on. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So if we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen while the more honorable parts do not require the special care, so God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dig dignity. Number four, each part should be celebrated and honored. See, there is a role for you right here, right now, and there is no, no mistake. It may not be glamorous. In fact, one of the things that Paul does at some point with the Corinthians is he talks to them about the fact that they are sitting there wishing that they had the gifting of somebody else. In fact, they were getting jealous because other individuals had gifts that they did not. And Paul comes back to it and says, don't feel that way because things like this, things that need to be covered up, things that aren't honorable are actually the ones that are most important. If you're walking into today, walk in today to this church, I think naturally many of us do this, but have you ever ranked what gifts you think are most important or who within the church is most important or maybe you've been someone who said i could never be like you i could never do that so instead i'm just going to stay right here one of the stories i heard this week was an individual who came to know the lord just recently and said you know what i don't i don't know what my place is i'm not sure where i should be and i don't really have anything to offer and i said no actually you do whether you've been a believer for a hundred seconds or you've been a believer for a hundred years, there is a spot. Because when you think about Sunday morning, when we come in, what's most important? In fact, many of us probably look past the things that are actually most important, the things that are covered up. The individuals right now that are behind the scenes, that are hanging out with the kids, are probably most important. The individuals that welcomed you when you came in, as I was talking to this individual, I said, maybe you're not going to be on stage preaching a message, but maybe you're going to be at the front door and you're going to meet somebody who's in a bad place. And you're going to be contagious with your energy because you're so excited about what God is doing right now. And that person is going to walk in needing to talk to you because your story is going to be their story. And when you share your story, they're going to go, I'm not alone. And they're going to stay here and they're going to sit in the seats and they're going to continue to come and they're going to hear something they never heard before and they're going to hear love, that God loves them, that they have a place, that they can be welcomed into the community, that they can make a difference in this world and they're going to come to know Jesus Christ for the very first time and they're going to get baptized right here on this stage. Who was the most important person in that scenario? Or maybe it's the life group leader that invites people into their home over and over and over again, has known people for years, and then all of a sudden something happens. And then the first one to respond, and they're there, and they've cared for this individual, and they've loved them, and they've known them, and they're there in tragedy, and they're there in crisis. And this person has walked through church their whole life, but has never really been changed by Christ. And yet, in this moment, life transformation happens because that life group leader was there in the toughest times. Who's most important in that scenario? Was it the preacher on stage preaching a message that they heard over and over and over again but were never changed by? Or was it the person who loved them so dearly that they were there in the moment that they were struggling the hardest and they said, you are cared for and they saw Christ's love firsthand? Who was most important? 
And so as we sit here, many of us look at me going, I could never do that. That's fantastic because I look at so many of you going, I could never do that. It'd be easy for me to want to train everybody to get up here with a gift of exhortation and challenge each one of us to use our gifts. And come on, and everybody just go, woo, all the time. But that wouldn't be any fun because if we were all going, woo, who'd be holding babies because I'm terrible at that. I barely want to hold my own niece because I'm afraid I'm going to break her. And yet, who's most important? The teachers with the kids right now are raising the next leaders. They're teaching Jesus to those that are someday going to go out and change the world. They're the next pastors. They're the next teachers. They're the next engineers. Maybe the next Billy Graham is in one of our Sunday school classes today. or life group leaders, or Bible study teachers, or individuals that are behind the scenes that do it week after week after week, who's most important? I'd argue they are. Because if it wasn't for the individuals that are here regularly doing those things, nobody come to listen to me. Because those are the individuals that make people feel like they're welcome, make people feel like they're home, make people feel like they want to be here over and over and over again. And that's what happens when we serve. That's what happens when each one of us says there is a place for me and we celebrate and we honor all of those places because every single one of them matters. And when we are a reflection of that in our own lives and we reflect the Trinity, then we can see that the relationship in the Trinity is the same sort of way, right? The Spirit gave the gifts. Well, that's a pretty big deal. So is he most important? Well, well, the Spirit gave the gifts. Well, we serve Christ. Well, serving's a big deal. We're serving Jesus. That's most important. But God's directing it. No, that's most... Wait a minute. They're all important. If you were to take the Trinity, rank them right now. Who's the most important? Anybody? Anybody at all? No. We would never do that. And yet that's the way community should look. When we serve each other, there is no rank. There is no one that's more important than the other. Each one of us has a role. And we can't live without our pinky toe. We might be able to. If you don't have a pinky toe, you can explain to me what it's like to live without one. But we need every part. And here's the beauty of the uniqueness in the oneness. Verse 25, it says, This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. We are all in this together. There's very clearly a you and me in the body of Christ. We have uniqueness. We have separate roles. We have things we are responsible for, but what you and I create together is us. And that us creates the whole body that when we're in it together, what does it bring? It brings harmony. That our uniquenesses brought together, utilized in the who we are of what it is that we do, that brings harmony. I look at our world today and I think that's the dream they're looking for. To find a way to take all of our differences and put them together and say, why can't we all just get along? Why can't we just accept that we're different? We don't all have to be the same. There's only one unifying force that will ever bring that together, and that's Jesus Christ. And we are a reflection of his love for the world. So what if we did this really, really well? What if we understood that we're different and we're never going to be the same? What if we used that to bring harmony with each other and we challenged each other and we pushed each other and we loved each other and we cried with each other and every so often somebody needs to be punched? And I'm a guy, so it's okay to say that. I'd never punch a lady. I'll just put that out there. But sometimes guys need just to like pound each other because we love each other. I say this over and over and over again. If guys aren't beating each other up or making fun of each other, they don't really like each other. 
My wife's one of four girls. When she came to my family with two other brothers, we were always jumping on each other and pounding on each other and being super mean to each other. And she's like, what is that about? I said, I love him. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Walk into a room of guys. If they're not doing that with each other, they don't really like each other. Because that's what you do when you come together. It's not that we have to be the same. In fact, the Bible says it's not same-mindedness, it's like-mindedness. You know where that like-mindedness lands? Within the person of Jesus Christ. That if we move towards him, that together we look like what the Trinity looks like, when we come together, the world will see the dream that they are longing for. Unity and love and caring. And we have a role in that. We need each other. So where does that take us? So Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, builds off this thought by Paul and tells us ultimately what these gifts lead to. He says this, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts, so use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Last point. Each gift is used to serve others so that God will be glorified. Verse 12, 7, here in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. And then 4, 1 Peter 4, 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. We are meant to serve each other. When we talk about serve, when we talk about pursue, connect, serve, reach, that serve starts right here. I want to challenge each of us, if we could serve each other, if we could be the individuals that come together in harmony because of our differences, and we live that out right here first, the world will look at us going, I want that. You know, oftentimes there's many divisions amongst us that begin here first rather than being resolved here first. So as a church, I want to be individuals that talk about the tough things, that challenge each other in the tough things, that strengthen each other by refining each other. Iron sharpens iron, right? You're refined by fire. And yet, be able to lay those things down because we can say in those differences they bring harmony because through Jesus and only him and his death on the cross that he has paved a way for us and that is the ultimate thing. And then our unique gifts will reflect the love that's within the Trinity, the differences yet oneness within the Trinity so the world can see something that they long for. And that's what we'll be talking about next week when we discuss reach. How do we reach this world? I tell you, it's very simple. It's a very, 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 very easy answer. But you're going to have to come back next week to find out. So if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, if you don't have a place here yet, if you're saying, hey, I'm not sure where I fit, I would love to talk to you. Our elders are going to be up here in front of the service as they are every Sunday. They would love to talk to you. Our staff is also passionate about, they would love to talk to you. Our life group leaders, I can find a number of people here today that would love to discuss with you what does that mean because my ultimate goal, as I've said the last couple of weeks, is 100% participation. This isn't a me thing. This isn't a you thing. This is a we thing. Because when we come together, when we reflect the Trinity, when we are one in our pursuit of God every day, the world will stand back and go, I want that. Next week, we'll talk about how we can do it.